let's start with where AI is leading us. So imagine a world 20, 25 years from now. And let's work backwards, not forwards, because forwards tends to be incremental. I suspect 80% of, 80 of all jobs that are economically valuable, and I don't care about AI philosophers, uh, but 80% of all jobs that are economically valuable and 80% of those functions will be capable of being done by an AI. And I say capable because I don't want to get into regulation and all that kind of stuff where things may slow down. But that's 64% of all valuable economic jobs globally will be capable of being done by an AI. That's the opportunity for entrepreneurs in the audience if they want to build a trillion dollar company. That's an incredible amount. It's orders of magnitude bigger than Google's current market, if you look at the world that way. So uh, uh, what is the opportunity? My answer is almost everything. Uh, and let's look at some areas. In, and I talked about this, I wrote a blog on this 10 years ago. Do we need doctors? Almost certainly the best doctors will be in AI. And I suspect the first AI only doctor, not AI doctor, but AI, and not AI assisted doctor, but AI only doctor will happen within five years from today. That means the FDA will approve an app to be a primary care doctor. And we're working on that. I'm pretty sure the, AI, uh, the FDA will approve an app to be an AI psychiatrist or an AI oncologist, probably a little bit later. If somebody is an oncologist in the audience, call me because oncology, nobody is doing with AI. Uh, so that's medicine. But will we have AI musicians? We have a company whose goal is to produce a top 10 music hit, untouched by a human being, on singing it, composing it, playing the instruments, composing the instruments, everything end to end. Music, media, art generation, game generation, and then all the enterprise functions, business analysts, That'll be done by an AI. So no matter where you look, you're going to see that. So uh, one of our startups actually uh, this morning pitched on that company that you just said you want to know if anyone's doing something on it. So I think I can help you out. Um, so Vinod, I'm sorry that you missed out on investing in open AI. <laughs> uh, you know, here's the way I should explain this. You know, why did we invest four or five years ago in OpenAI? Actually, open just, AI just to all? clarify, I was joking. Vinod was the first to invest in OpenAI. So I bet no one has asked him, how do you feel about not investing it? Because he did invest in it. So that was being <laughs> ironic. Ladies and gentlemen, Vinod. Uh, well, thank you. And the, the process is pretty interesting, right? Um, let me take you back a long time ago. I started Sun in 1980, uh, sorry, 1982, right? And the internet was just beginning. Is he, is he... But it was already growing exponentially and the early parts of an exponential are almost flat. And the knee of the curve on the internet growth didn't happen till 1996. In 1982, we made TCP IP standard in every machine. Uh, and people just objected to that, uh, customers did. Uh, I won't spend too much time. 1986, when we, the browser happened and I was at Kleiner when we invested in Netscape and Amazon and then Google soon after that, the internet was happening. But the largest venture return, and this is an important story, came because we expected the exponential growth of the internet in 1996 
when every major telco said they would never use TCP IP in the public network. And I want to take a dig at the experts. Every expert said the core of the public backbone would be ATM technology, for those of you who are old enough to have heard that term. And when we started Juniper, which turned out to be a 2,500x return, so $7 billion in as distributed profit for Kleiner on a 3 or $4 million investment, uh, it was because we believed in this exponential. Long way of saying, fast forward to five years ago, or actually when I first wrote my blog on do we need doctors, I wrote a companion blog in January of 2012, do we need teachers? Because I figured most teaching would be done by an AI. And, uh, and on the nonprofit side, our family is developing an AI tutor, my wife's nonprofit is doing that. Uh, it was clear we were in the 1980s era of AI where it was growing exponentially, innovating exponentially, but not visible. By five years ago, when we invested in uh, OpenAI in 2018 or 19, I forget, um, one of those times, it was clear in five years we were going to see an exponential capability increase. And, and that's when we invested. But it was very uncertain. Nobody else believed it. But that's the best time for entrepreneurs to jump into an area and, frankly, to your investing audience. Uh, that's the time to jump in. It's when you're most uncertain, when the conventional wisdom isn't everybody believing in it, um, which is when valuations go through the roof, it's when you're early in predicting these trends. Um, so really, really important to pick these points. Here's what I would say. I think GPT-4 is a transition point, and of course, the world's imagination caught fire with ChatGPT uh, uh, last September, which, by the way, wasn't even a planned product. OpenAI hadn't planned on releasing that product. Uh, didn't know whether they were going to release it. Uh, they were going to wait for GPT-4 as an alternative. Um, think of GPT-5 and GPT-6. They will be as big a jump from GPT-4 as GPT-4 was from GPT-3 and GPT-3 was from GPT-2. So this is just the beginning of exponential capability. And for the entrepreneurs in the audience, I'd say skate where the puck is going, not where it is. Almost ignore GPT-4, say it's a great prototyping tool. Where do I want to be in two or three years when GPT-6 is around? So you sort of touched on this, but how can founders, and, and yell if you're, you're a founder, how can founders build something defensible in AI? I feel like you've given a little bit of advice, but anything more before I go to the big picture? Okay. So this is the hard part. <clears throat> if I'll give you the following example. I looked at the recent YC batch. When, they, when OpenAI released one feature, which is plugins. About half the batch got obsolete. Uh, literally, they were doing something minor with ChatGPT or GPT-4. Uh, and almost half the batch plans were obsolete as soon as plugins were released and you could connect in interesting ways with other systems. So it is hard for an entrepreneur. Most of the YC, was wrappers around GPT-4, which is also not defensible. So I'm talking about what's not defensible. Yeah, you're not answering the question I asked. I, I am getting to the questions. I'm first saying the don'ts. Okay. Then I'll do the, tell yeah, you I'm the do's. I'm not gonna give you five stars in this question until I hear, hear the, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 by the way, I don't need five stars from you. I don't need validation for you, so. Yeah. <laughs> Important As I said, he's irreverent. <laughs> Vinod Kosa, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I love you, Vinod. Uh, uh, it, there's an important message for founders. Don't listen to what others are saying. The most important thing a founder does 
is decide whose advice to take on what topic. Way too many people will give you advice and are qualified to give you advice. So as that was an aside, back to what you do do. First, you assemble great teams. Teams that can stay ahead of the curve. Um, uh, and I don't think uh, uh, Patrick will mind me saying that. Uh, Patrick Collison and I had lunch. And we both decided after an hour and a half, we were confused about how things will evolve. Now think about it. He's played with every model himself. He's confused. I'm confused. What can you do to solve that? The big, big do is assemble a great team that will follow the development and get ahead of them and know how to leverage them. So many startups I see are taking a software engineer who just happened to be relabeled an ML engineer. That's not good enough to build a resilient, long-lasting company. Um, the second thing I would say is look hard at what uh, everything that others can do quite easily. And why aren't they doing it? What happens when they see you being successful and follow you? That will happen. And so that's another don't, but that says, look at the areas where you will build defensibility. There okay. is industry specific knowledge. I don't believe industry specific data will matter as much, but industry specific knowledge will matter. So take a larger vertical, paint a five-year vision and say, GPT-4 can help me do this and I'll build the other pieces. When GPT-5 comes, it'll be a lot more powerful. Uh, we'll do these other things. So build a path over the next five years with a great team that can anticipate the development of features. Um, that's to the people building applications on GPT-4. But I suspect there's some people in the audience who say, this is not the end all, uh, and large language models is not the only way to do AI. So we are actively investing in alternatives, approaches to large language models, bigger and bigger models. Um, those of you who are in the audience who understand what I'm saying. Um, Hold on, raise your hand if you understand what he's saying. All right, a lot of people put their hands up. Raise your hand if you are willing to admit you don't understand what he's saying. Okay, the majority did understand, just so you know, smart group. Yeah. All right, So I have another question, but keep, keep going. So there are approaches beyond large language models that should be investigated in a way, and whole startups could be started. Uh, what will look like OpenAI five years from now as a technique or an approach? And I can tell you there's some really interesting work at MIT I've seen over time um, uh, uh, that could be an alternative to large language models or additive to that model. So uh, there are ways to build differentiation, both in the application domain, in the fundamental model domain, and in assembling the right teams to go after uh, these products. Most startups either don't have great AI co-founder, or they don't have a great product sense co-founder. And you can't hire a product manager in this space. You have to have a founder with founder authority who can, who can zig and zag to the right product formulation and has the moral authority of a founder. So assembling your team is key. Most of all, you need the right in advice. Um, and I'm well known for saying most investors add little value and many add negative value. If you Google that, my name pops up. Why? Because they take a very, and, and this is a message to investors, take a longer view than short term. Because people take a very short term, where can you generate um, revenue? Fundamentally, the big problem with YC startups I saw in this batch is they're all focused on one metric. What is their MRR or ARR? And what is the growth rate of that? Not what their defensibility will be. Wrong approach in this market because most simple things will be obsolete. 
Um, so big picture, I hear a lot of people saying that mobile and the internet is pretty big, but this AI moment is bigger. Can you imagine something in the next 100 years that could be bigger than this AI moment? Well, I never say never, but currently I can't think of it. If most human jobs can mostly be replaced, um, then we'll be in the era of great abundance and GDP growth and productivity growth and being able to be more creative with a creative AI, music, art, storytelling, all done by AIs, um, all the way to oncology and medicine and so in web robotics two, and AI. Yeah, yeah, robotics is another area we haven't talked about. Yeah. Huge opportunity in robotics. Uh, obviously, a lot of opportunity in all the enterprise software stuff. Um, so almost everything you can imagine. For those interested in, uh, in looking at the enterprise software, I would urge you to watch Satya Nadella's uh, talk on the future of work that he did recently. I found it incredibly impressive. I literally called him and told him how impressive it was. Um, it imagines a different way to work. Um, so so let, let me so, build on that. So people won't, um, will likely won't have to work in uh, 40 to 30 years as they're working as we imagine it now. Uh, but until then, AI could create significant wealth inequalities as it disrupts industries. Like, do you think AI, AI is helping you financially? Oh, absolutely. It'll help yeah, me make right, more right. money. So, yeah, so you're, so you're doing okay. But what do you think about this in, an inequality for some that may not cash in on this moment? So seven years ago, and I'd refer people to this, uh, I wrote a blog in, I think it was Forbes or Fortune. Uh, Forbes, maybe it was my Forbes. chief of staff. It was in Forbes that said AI will cause, this was seven years ago, great abundance, great GDP growth, great productivity growth, all the metrics economists use. So great time and increasing uh, income inequality. That's going to be a major problem. And the solutions to that will be social. Bill Gates has talked about a robot tax. Maybe there's an AI tax. I don't know the solution, but society will have to uh, address income disparity, which will be increasing, not decreasing. And it worries me. Probably the single biggest thing about AI that worries me and our inability to realize that we are in an era of great abundance and we have the resources to support the neediest and in fact, I think universal big, big basic income, which I talked about seven years ago in this blog, towards the end of the blog, is something that will be a possibility because per capita income, if I'm right, by 2050 or so, will be so high and by 2100, just through the roof, um, so, that we will have the ability to support people uh, whether we do it or not is a political question. Yeah, so you were pretty busy in 2016. You, you said a lot. Um, hey, blind spots. We have a lot of MIT people here. Who's with MIT? Yay, yay. So no, say something so he can't see everyone. So everyone say if you're with MIT, go. Yeah, OK. So what do smart MIT folks and, and the public not understand about this AI moment and, and chat GPT? Like, is there? things that, that, that misconceptions, like say something profound and provocative. Well, first I would say, since I have written a lot, uh, I would, uh, so those of you interested in large renovation in medicine, uh, I wrote a hundred page document about 80, eight years ago called 20% Doctor Included. And I'd recommend people read the transformation in medicine I envision. Uh, eight years ago that uh, I said would take 25 years and now I think will take less than 15 years from that time. Um, uh, so what does that mean? I think people are expecting a wave. What's going to hit us is a tsunami. All right, we, are at, 
Yeah, do you want yeah. to finish so, that thought? I have my last two questions. Yeah. Um, a tsunami is a very different phenomenon than a wave. Have we had a tsunami uh, uh, in, our, in your lifetime, in our lifetime? Not in business. You know, the largest transition we saw was in agricultural employment, which went from 50% of U.S. employment in the year 1900 to a few percent by the 1970s. But that took a long time. So we had multiple generations to adjust and relocate people and people to move to the cities. I think this will be so much faster. We will have a hard time adjusting, and that'll be a big challenge for society. There's, of course, AI and defense and warfare and cybersecurity. I worry about that a lot. I worry a little less about AI safety and sentient, not because they are unimportant. They're very, very important and should be the primary area of government funding for AI research. Uh, it should be the principal area of research. But my, my bigger threat I worry about is a powerful AI in, in our adversaries' hands like Russia and China uh, going after us, both for hard power, which is warfare and cyber warfare, but also soft power like economic influence over the rest of the world. I worry about that a lot. All right. So, Vinod, I got two final questions, and I'm going to say them both at the same time not over on top of each other. I'll say one and then the next one. All right, you talk a lot about the last seven years ago, what you said. What do you think the next five years in terms of tech progress is gonna look like? This program is called Imagination in Action. Like there are a lot of people who are imagining but not making action happen. Talk about what you think the next five years look like and what action people should be doing. That's one question. And then my last question, which I know is very dear to your heart, uh, the environment. Where do you see opportunities for AI and sustainability? What bets are you looking to make that both can do good in terms of sustainability? If we don't do it this decade, you know, we're going to be in real trouble. But also, where are some of the business opportunities? Because if we get those out there, there could be you know, a synergistic thing going on. So five years in environment. Well, the one thing I would say is the rate of development is hard to predict. So I would only say anybody who says what will be possible in five years is wrong. And smart people won't predict the, the, where, what will be developed or not. But what I will say is mostly what people imagine when they say AI won't be able to do X, they're more likely to be wrong than right. Um, and especially within the set of things we as human beings can think of, developing because we think more linearly than the exponentials we are in the middle of, the tsunami or the typhoon. This isn't a wind, it's a typhoon we are in the middle of. Uh, it'll be more disruptive. And by the way, disruptive means not fun to be disrupted, very hard for those who are disrupted, but huge opportunities for entrepreneurs and also for you, the investors in your audience. You know, I actually just um, thought of saying, so Mark Twain and, and Shakespeare get quoted a lot. I don't know if you get put in the same line as that, but you get quoted a lot. Is there anything you've been quoted on that you think people got wrong? Oh, hard for me to think. Let me answer your climate question. Maybe if I have time, I'll yeah. think about where I've been quoted wrong. Yeah. Uh, or or no. they don't necessarily understand the intent of the, of the point that they just run with it for sh like a shock jock. So climate solutions uh, will take hard science. It's a different problem. Um, AI can play a role there, but AI will not be transformative in climate, unfortunately, that I've seen. I've looked at the NIPS papers on climate, uh, AI and climate, they're playing on the edges. I didn't find a single compelling paper on AI's role in climate so far. So if any of your audience has seen something, uh, and I did my survey probably 18 months ago, uh, please send it to me. My email is ovk, which is office of vk at coastalventures.com. Uh, but climate is about hard science. I'm very excited about Conval Fusion Bob Mumgard was a senior fellow at the MIT Plasma Fusion Lab. When I first met him and we helped 
uh, sort of get that thing going, and I'm very excited. It can be transformative. In fact, fusion and AI are the two things that can be most transformative of the planet. Um, uh, there is only a dozen areas in climate that matter, and a dozen people could change the climate picture dramatically over the next 15, 20 years. I won't go, get into the details of that, but I wrote a blog about it in July of 21. Uh, so you can find it someplace. Um, but AI's role will be there, like better material science, discovering a new material. AI could do a good job. I recently asked what AI can do to develop a room temperature superconductor, which is not transformative itself, but could be hugely helpful. Um, catalysts, room temperature superconductors, um, but by and large, the mechanical world, the bits world is driven by bits phenomena. Could you design a better bug to mine, uh, uh, take lithium out of brines? Probably. I hope somebody is working on it. And bio and lithium, uh, bio and mining would be really interesting. Bio mining is a huge area of interest for me personally because of how bad the current extractive industries are uh, extracting lithium out of uh, seawater. Plenty of it, but just very uneconomic to do today. Could you improve that a hundredfold? Yeah. Should be Actually, possible. Vinod, Vinod let, me, let me interrupt for a second. I'm gonna retract that last question because I decided it's not so good. So our last speaker had dinner with Kai Fu uh, the other day. China versus uh, um, US in terms of AI, I'm curious your, your take on that, what we need to know. And I also want you to know, you have a lot of friends here. Kim Pelosi's in the room, and she, she's waving. Uh, Ramesh Rasker, I know you've done a lot with him over the years. Taylor, who I introduced you to, he's in here. He's very happy that you guys are, are working with him. So you got a lot of friends in addition to a lot of people who've never met you. So thank you for being you. I, and, and I'm glad you brought this up. This is a good note to end on. I believe we are in a massive techno-economic war with China. This is not gonna be pretty. It will be good for the planet. Either party wins, it's good for the planet. But I want Western values to win over the Chinese political system. And that will depend on who has the best technology in a couple of areas. AI being dominant because of its global impact. The second is fusion, I think, uh, or energy is the second area. Those two areas will determine who has economic influence and hence political influence globally. And I want Western values to win. So I consider us at war with China on the front. That's a very different kind of war than the one we worry about in Taiwan or Ukraine. Ladies and gentlemen, Vinod Khosla! Thank you, everybody.